Welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today is Friday, October 15th, 2021. Thank you for tuning in to this late edition to the Grand Solar Minimum News update. Let's get right started with some space weather. Right now, our solar wind speeds are down to 343.1 kilometers per second with a density of 8.2. So all things are pretty quiet right now. In fact, looking at the sun, you still have two sunspots to talk about, but you can see as it's going away in the very, very um, northwestern limb of the star. And remember, that's opposite of what we're looking at here. But there are two sunspots that are leaving Earth. That's sunspot number 24. Those are very small sunspot numbers. And something tells me that we are dealing with um, AR2882 more than AR2883. AR2883 is very, very small. So uh, the majority of this sunspot action is coming from AR2882. Checking out our TCI is 6.51. Now that jumped up from 5.96. TCI is the Thermosphere Climate Index. That, that basically grades the very, very top of our atmosphere. And right now it's considered in the very, very cold, well, very cold range, I should say. Uh, but we see the TSI, TCI go up when we see higher solar winds. And we just had a couple of geomagnetic activity um, as far as storms go, a G1 and a G2. And then we've had high solar winds anywhere from 450 to 500 kilometers per second. We did not ex get the big solar wind like I thought we would, honestly, to push it in continuous G2 storm. But nonetheless, it still heated up the very tip of the atmosphere and as a result, we are dealing with a little bit slightly higher values. But folks, I'm here to tell you that 6.51 is cold. The record is 2.05. So that's we're way off of that record cold. But just to give you an idea of what the record high is for the TCI, that is 49.4. Okay. So we are still way above, we are still way below the record as far as um as far as the, the TCI being warm or anything like that. Two for the KP right now, and it's a 24-hour max of two. Let's shuffle over to the grandsolarminimum.com and check out our space weather section. I wanted to... I actually, you know what? It's not updating, so I'm, I'm not going to go there. I wanted to look at solar x-ray flux, and that is not updating, so... Let's just go ahead and go right into, oh, cosmic radiation, 9.3%. Folks, that's important to pay attention to. There is a lot of things going on right now, and it's starting to make a lot more sense. And it's just amazing on how some of this um, stuff that's being revealed to me is, is affected by this planet. Not just cosmic rays and, and cloud nucleation is one thing, folks. I think Mari actually stumbled onto something. I don't know if anybody's noticed this, but now, if you take your temperature on a thermometer, you're running about 97.5, 97.7. I remember the article for this about a year ago or so, talking about the new norm is now 97.7. No one really scratched the, the, the tip of the iceberg as far as why, though. Well, Mari has a very interesting theory, and that theory could be proven in the very near future. However, right now, we speculate. Check this out. The sun's activity not only controls the climate on here on Earth, but the energy the sun brings us controls the body temperature as well. Think about it, folks. All of a sudden, we have decreased total solar radiance, we have a weak magnetosphere and an abundance of cosmic radiation. Abundance of cosmic radiation. I showed you the chart where we were high for quite some time with cosmic radiation. In fact, this has been one of the longest stints we've seen cosmic rays as high as it has been. So, really, things are much bigger than just a grand solar minimum, folks. It goes beyond that. Something in the universe is triggering this something in the universe is bringing all of this energy to earth these cosmic radiation dosage rates show us the minute solar wind goes away 
we're right over 9% again. Remember, folks, just 5, 10 years ago, 5% was high, okay? Now we've been hanging around 8.5% or higher for almost the last three and a half years. We've never seen that before. So with the continuing weakening magnetosphere, and that's being displayed right now when you look at the stats on, on the um, cosmic radiation, okay? So, weak magnetosphere, weak activity from the sun, lower activity from the sun, lower TSI from the sun, why not lower body temperatures? Folks, it makes sense. It has to make sense, right? Think about it. Why all of a sudden did everybody's body temperature drop to 97.7? Is anybody out there paying attention? I'm looking in the chat right now, and I'm just kind of surprised that no one, is anybody else curious or is this just me? Is this just a me and Mari moment? Why your body temperature is lower? Folks, if this can be proven scientifically, if this could be proven scientifically, think about what that will impact on when you hear someone from the IPCC telling you that the sun is too little of a variable to impact the climate on Earth. But yet, we find the possibility of the sun lowering humans' body temperatures by one degree? That's a game changer, folks. And the other day when we did the article, we did the, um, we covered Svensmark's new study and everybody's like, oh, that, that's been out. That's been, no, 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 no. This was published October 11th. And the reason why I wanted to cover it is because it confirms what Svensmark has been saying the whole time. Now, he's a lot more careful about what this actually means for um, climate change. You know, a lot of scientists get ridiculed and discredited when they talk about solar cycles and cooling. So he doesn't go into the whole global cooling, global warming issue. He's just simply reporting on what he's finding in his research. So we've got the cosmic radiation connection with cloud nucleation, how it reduces also the cloud nucleation reduces TSI affecting the planet. But yet, if we're, if we're experiencing lower TSI, temperatures are lower on the surface, correct? And right now, it's being rumored that we're down one squared watt per meter. Wait, one watt per square meter. That's what it is. One watt per square meter of the sun is what we're down right now. So think about that. If one watt per square meter equals 0.9 degrees Fahrenheit drop in body temp, and then you're going to tell me that the sun you do you guys see what I'm trying to say here the cosmic radiation is impacting us in more ways than we can ever imagine and it shows people are going crazy today i i think everyone's crazy all the stuff that we see in the news the people getting fired from their jobs for doing crazy things Famous people that we never thought could do things like this. It's crazy. Nobody has patience. Everyone's losing it really fast. They're popping off. It's that cosmic radiation, folks. I'm telling you. Mari is doing a really good job at explaining what's actually happening, folks. And we will continue to study the science of Grand Solar Minimum. But this could be something bigger than just uh, 10 to 40 years of climate change natural climate change folks so there's a lot of change coming all right let's go ahead and check out an update on our volcano that's right la palma she's still going off and and folks i'm gonna tell you this it's you know i kind of stopped covering it for a few days i didn't want to like beat a dead horse right i wasn't trying to make a mountain of a molehill but I think I'm doing a disservice because I just checked Volcano Discovery and there's quite a bit of action going on here, folks. Uh, La Palma is not settling down. It's not getting crazy or anything. As you can tell right now, this is a live look at La Palma. And the SO2 actually is uh, very low right now. 
seventeen point seventy seven. Oh, oh, nope. I, I, I apologize. It's seventeen thousand seven hundred and seventy four gigatons a day. That's up. That's back up. It was down to around six thousand gigatons per day. Now it's up to seventeen. So the SO two is back. Okay, that's a definite abundance. Uh, we continue to see this thing erupting with lava flows. Now, there's no fountain, and we have seen that in the past where a, a fountain shooting up pretty high of lava. But check this out. We got reports that earthquakes continue to increase. The largest so far, a quake that occurred about two hours ago, uh, it was a magnitude of a four. I'm sorry, this was earlier this morning. This was 8.02 a.m. A magnitude 4.5 on the southern tip of the uh, island here, folks. So lots of action going over. It said it was felt all over the um, all over the island. The elusive and explosive activity activity continue at elevated levels during the night and this morning. Frequent lava surges have occurred at the crater. Large amounts of lava can be seen flowing out into surges from the breach crater, covering the lower northwestern flanks of the cone with sheet-like flows. These lava flows events are likely to be caused by partial collapse at or around the lower vent in particular. It can be seen producing constant pulsating voluminous lava fountains while degas lava flows out of its from its base. This activity leads to constant changes in morphology of the crater area by rapid accumulation of material in the vicinity of the vents. The new newly formed structures at the time become too steep or otherwise unstable then collapse. When this happens, larger amounts of lava that have been confined behind temporary dams can escape quickly and causing the observed surges that we have seen over the past several days. So the lava flow is going all the way out to the ocean. We know that. And of course, this area has been evacuated for the concerns of acid rain, but tremors and magma infusion rate remain high. More lava than visible at the vent is going directly into lava tubes that feed various parts of the flow field downslope, most notably a number of active flow fronts along the northern margin. Some lava flows are now only about 500 meters from the center of La Guana, La Laguana, I should say, while another arm is likely to create a new sea entry. The volcanic tremor remains unchanged at high levels in tandem with the infrared eruption rate of magna reaching the surface. Earthquakes. Uh, the past 24 hours, we've seen magnitude 4.2, 26 quakes between 3.0 and 4.0, and 87 quakes between 2.0 and 3.0, almost double the number of yesterday's earthquakes. So the seismic activity continues. Uh, we continue to see lava flowing very, very uh, well tonight as well. So we'll continue to watch this as this volcano, remember, the VEI-1 was the actual eruption uh, for this particular uh, volcanic uh, eruption. And VEI-2 is very small on scale of a VEI-8, which is the, the biggest ever. Uh, I don't expect anything like that, per se, but it will be interesting to continue to watch what is happening here at La Palma. I figured things would be slowing down by now, just by a little bit. Uh, not the case. In fact, they have a, a list here on what day they stuck. They took that off. It looks like usually they have what day this is on the eruption. So, oh, they do. This is the 28th day. Remember, Kilauea went on for quite some time too. Very impressive as well, but nothing too crazy, nothing too uh, disruptive right now. And we'll continue to monitor this here at the Grand Solar Minimum Channel. All right, let's take a look at some winter weather. That's right, we had tons of snow, and folks, I had to just go back to raw maps to find out what happened in this snowstorm a few days ago. I found it, but not a lot of information here. Watchers News has an article that says, Truck drivers say highway closures and restrictions in parts of the Intermountain West and Rockies during a winter storm are complicating supply chain issues. You don't say. Lots of snowfall there, right? Right, right, okay. Major snowstorm hits Wyoming, creating traffic jams and bringing wildfire relief. That's a good news, right? The first big snowstorm of the season led to a major travel issue in Wyoming this week, but also helped the wildfire fight in parts of neighboring Montana. The storm dropped as much as 20 inches at Soldier Park and 19 in Henson Sawmill. 
and about 18 inches at Cloud Peak, 17.4 inches in Casper. This is all on October 13. The highest total at any community was a lower level, a lower elevation was at 18 inches southwest of Buffalo, not New York, folks. Uh, so lots of heavy snow, right? Weather Channel also briefly talks about it four days ago. I know that I'm a little late on this one here, but still, uh, not a lot of information. Heavy snow, beautiful pictures here, trees down, and this is what I was talking about. If you get a, a storm right around now, you're going to have to deal with power outages because of leaves that have not fallen yet off of trees, therefore accumulating ice and snow, if, especially if it's the heavy wet kind. And next thing you know, you have tree limbs bending and breaking and taking down power lines with it. We saw more than 11 inches in parts of Utah. So where else? Where else, right? Where else did we see all the snow? Well, let's take a look at this map. Oh, a little pop there. So we're looking, let's zoom out so we know where we are. This, this legend won't move here, so I'll just have to move it for you. I'm moving my arrow across the swaths here, and I'll tell you exactly where we got the highs. Now, I'll tell you, North Dakota and South Dakota originally did not look like they were going to get much. However, that did not um, that did not hold up. They definitely got some snow. They got probably some of the heavier snowfall. In fact, let's go zoom in here. This little legend will tell us exactly. We got 18 inches here in parts of east or southeastern Montana, and of course, uh, 18 inches in parts of North west south dakota and also southwest north dakota 18 inches had fallen most parts in wyoming widespread of three to eight inches of snow as we can see several areas here there's a little yellow spot here we're looking at six inches um, but again this was our first major snow system and it didn't really drop so much across the rockies as i thought it would but oh here we go Actually, I wanted to show you the, the big one here. So we know we got about 20 inches of snow in parts of Montana, but we did have a 24 inch total here somewhere. I'm gonna to try to find that real quick. Nonetheless, it was a pretty impressive first of the year snowstorm. Some snow records were broken with this. Whoop, there it is. I'd have to guess that this is at a higher elevation with the 24 inches of snow. By the way, this is a 72 hour total so but the snow did quit falling shortly after the storm so this is nothing um, of any additional snow expected at the time as we know and i wanted to show you before a volcanic comet blows its top yeah that's right a volcanic comet it says here so you think you know what a comet is think again comet 29p swassman washman is challenging old ideas astronomers call it a comet but in reality a giant space volcano might be a better description. It's 60 kilometers wide, ball of ice orbiting the sun beyond Jupiter, and it appears to be one of the most volcanically active bodies in the entire solar system. It'd be interesting to know how much vol volcanic activity has picked up over the last four years, too. Comet 29P just blew its top again in late September of 2021, erupted four times quick succession blowing shells of cryomagna cryo -magna into space. That's right, cryomagna. Arizona amateur astronomer Elliot Herman has been monitoring the debris. This is crazy. We got volcanoes here on Earth going off. We got volcanoes in space going off. And you know what's interesting is that the first capture here is on the left, September 30th, right around the same time we saw La Palma going off. And to this day, we have this same comet blowing its top. Initially, it looked like a bright, compact object. Now, the expanding cloud is about 1.3 acrominutes wide, bigger than Jupiter, and sufficiently transparent for background stars to shine through. When this object was discovered in 1927, astronomers thought they had found a fairly run-of-the-mill comet. Unusual, mainly because it was trapped in a nearly circular orbit between Jupiter and Saturn. 29P quickly proved them was wrong as it began to erupt over and over and over again. Modern observations show that outbursts are happening as often as 20 times a year. So interesting stuff here, folks. Not only are we seeing volcanoes here on Earth, I'm sure we are having uh, all kinds of problems with volcanic activity on every single planet in the solar system. 
Remember, the sun is in a grand solar minimum. The sun controls the solar system, right? Turn this, I heard a big bang. The sun controls the solar system. So whatever effects that come from the sun is going to affect the entire solar system, including apparently volcanic comets. They are going off as well. This one's going off as 20 times a year. Again, they've been monitoring this since 1927. I'd be curious to, to look at recent data and see if there's been an uptick due to the sun's lack of activity here in the last four years, which is continuing, by the way. All right, let's take a look at our uh, GFS outlook real quick. We got rain moving in right now for Saturday, okay? If you live in the Midwest, parts of Ohio Valley, western New York, central New York, you're going to wake up to rain showers. This is actually overnight in the morning Saturday. And if you got plans Saturday morning and you live in the Ohio Valley and northeast, not looking good for you. Uh, we have rain showers, constant rain showers, no severe weather, no storms. But behind it is a cold front that might bring snow in. Yeah, might. Anyway, the heavier rain moves through western New York into central New York and then into the capital region and into Vermont and New Hampshire. The bulk of this really nails our neighboring friends in Canada. But like I said, a cold front behind this, and that's when temperatures start to act a little bit more like fall, at least here in the northeast. Now, parts of the northwest, too, looking at snow in Washington and parts of northern California, and they kind of need it. Um, their, their reservoirs need to be filled a little bit better. So this is a welcome sign. More snow chances for the Rockies moving into Tuesday, October 9th. Nothing like what we just had, but still a good clip of snow could fall in Wyoming. And that low pressure system stalls out as it goes across the Northern Plain states into the Great Lakes. Nothing major here, folks. Just a bunch of rain, snow in Canada. And a cold front does reach parts of the Great Lakes, Wisconsin, Michigan, Western New York, and maybe, maybe the capital region of New York. But look at that. That cold front reaches back past the southern parts of Illinois and Indiana. So Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, all the mid-Atlantic states should see this cold front by next weekend that could produce, and I said it last week, Yes, North Country here in New York at the end of this month, October 25th, we are looking at a chance for snow overnight, Monday, October 25th. I usually don't read into much of these um, forecasts this uh, long into it, but this is the second time that we have seen this signal from GFS. So... Like I said, Monday, quiet, some snow coming in over the Rockies. Not a lot, a little bit, stalls out, breaks up a little bit, and becomes rain for the most part for the Great Lakes. This is next week, October 21st. Moving into the weekend next weekend, there's another blast of colder air coming in, and that could affect the Great Lakes. We could see snow in the upper parts of New York and the Capital Region by Monday, October 24th. Folks in Vermont... And Maine as well could see some snow showers. Meanwhile, we got another low pressure system churning up on the northwestern coast. Oregon, Washington with a mix of rain and snow. Again, folks, the deeper we get into October, obviously, we're going to start seeing colder weather and more snowfall. Something going on in the Gulf, I don't know yet. GFS usually is, when they have things like this, it's an indication that we've got some kind of a storm system brewing. I'm a little more concerned about the northeastern part of the United States that they're signaling a low pressure system that just moves across the country, actually comes in from Canada, and then connects with the system out of the Gulf. That high pressure that's coming in from Canada, excuse me folks, I'll have to turn that down. Sounds like there's a car out here in front of this, this, this lava cam here. So... The possibility of this system linking up with what's in the Gulf, well, the high-pressure system that's coming in from Canada is reaching far south and is pushing this system here in the Gulf out of the picture. So if there was a chance, let's watch this real quick one more time there. This is around October 27th. You guys see we've got a disturbance here, but that high pressure, guys, look how much it's just dominating right here, folks, and it's keeping whatever tropical weather far south of the coast which is good news our, our people you know we're, we're tired of this stuff here let's go actually hurricane season is almost officially over technically it is but anyway we'll still watch and then we try to see something in the gulf 
right here near Mexico, try to get its act together. But again, it's this high pressure and more high pressure coming in from here that keeps this at bay and actually pushes this storm system further south as we move into October 26th, October 27th. It tries to reach the Gulf Coast on the 27th, and then that high pressure finally dominates and pushes it back down in the Gulf. But moisture from the Gulf does connect with this low pressure system that's racing across the, the middle part of our country, and this storm could turn into something interesting. Thank God that we do not have uh, temperatures cold enough to support any kind of snow because this almost looks like a nor'easter the way it's raking the east coast and going all the way up through Maine into Nova Scotia and out the door she goes. But more snow and ice coming here for the northwestern parts of the United States, Montana, Oregon, and Washington, and some parts of Wyoming as well, probably in the higher elevations. So nothing too crazy yet winter-like. We're getting through October, and I think things are settling the way they should be. A little bit above average in certain places. This is uh, tomorrow. Your daytime highs tomorrow. Look at that ridge and fridge, as Joe Bastardi would call it. Here's the ridge, and this is the fridge. Now, the fridge is not really working right now. It's still pretty warm. In fact, these are health code violations if these are actually refrigerators in your local restaurants. But nonetheless, this is where the ridge is. This is where the warmer air is. Much cooler air coming in behind it as we move through Saturday. This low pressure system bringing lots of moisture to the northeast is also going to drop temperatures across the Ohio Valley into the northeast. Overnight lows dropping almost near in the upper 30s. Daytime highs, well, Cincinnati, Ohio, you're looking at 60 degrees. That's right, 60 degrees for a daytime high on October 17th. It's actually pretty beautiful, uh, if you ask me, for this time of year in southwest Ohio. 51 for the high in the capital region here in New York on Monday. Forecasting only a high of 49 degrees here where Mari and I are located. Most of us here in the Northeast also expecting that. If you live in the Northwest, not much better on Monday. 50s and 40s all across parts of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and of course Nevada, the northern parts of Nevada. Most of Utah will be in the 40s and 50s. But again, folks in this part of the country here uh, are very happy to see the cooler weather. They have had some extreme heat this summer. Now, the central part of the United States continues to remain nice. I'll just say nice. Not hot, not warm, just nice out. You know, 69 degrees for a daytime high. 65 in McCook, Nebraska. That's not bad. In the 80s in Florida, this is where you want to go anyway when you start seeing this kind of weather here and here. You all just kind of migrate down here and just chill for a few months, right? All right, so let's keep moving with our temperatures. October 19th. More cold coming into the northwest so far. The northwest has had its share. And this is a mini ridge and fridge because this warm air won't actually make it all the way up the east coast like it did this time. So we're starting to see a new trend here. And this is another idea that, or another theory that we are starting to see the seasons change and force this warming out. Usually on ridge and uh, fridges, we see the ridge going all the way up the east coast, right? Well, not on this one, October 21st. We're going to see temperatures in the 70s and 80s in the mid-Atlantic states, but once it gets up here past New Jersey and New York City, 60s for the high. What does that mean? Are we going to get really, really cold? Not really, but we're not going to get really warm either. As we look at temperatures the next weekend on Saturday, that's seven days from now, daytime highs only in the 40s. Look at that, guys. That's high temperatures, folks, in Wisconsin, Minnesota. North Dakota, Iowa, starting to see that winter. Oh, that, there's your daytime. I apologize. Still, 50s and 40s for highs. Overnight lows below freezing. That will be probably your first hard freeze if you live in the northwestern or the northern plain states. Minnesota, Wisconsin, a widespread hard freeze is set. Same with you folks in Michigan, Scott Rose near Detroit. This could be the first hard freeze of the season and will stop all growing. Temperatures remaining cool throughout the Great Lakes and the Northeast, highs in the 40s and 50s, overnight lows touching in the 30s and 20s for most of you. So we're starting to see this transition of much colder air in the Northeast and the Northwest, but yet the central of the country is still remaining in the 60s and 70s. Folks, this is almost identical to the way the year kind of started off last year with all the cold weather being in the corners and the warmer weather being in the middle part of the United States. I have a feeling that's going to change. Notice this last ridge and fridge here, guys. This is another warm for up. Cold is going to push this air up to the east coast again. Watch how this ridge plays out this time. So each one we saw so far is getting weaker and not reaching up as far north. You see that? No 70s or 80s up the east coast on that one. 
So by the time we get to end of October, this is where we should be, right? It's fall. It's fall. These are overnight lows across the United States. Everyone's going to be, ew, even, even Florida looks chilly in the 50s. That's freezing for them. So fall is coming. Winter is knocking on the door already in parts of the Northwest. Not so much here in the Northeast and not really anywhere else. But the Northwest is getting the first dose of winter so far. And I'll tell you what, I think we're in for a long, cold, snowy winter for a lot of us here in the northern parts of the United States. The Northeast, the Ohio Valley, the Great Lakes, the Northern Plains states, across the Dakotas and the Northwestern parts. I will say this, I expect snow in the Ohio Valley this year. I expect snow obviously to pummel like it usually does and possibly further south again we saw lots of snow in northern texas if we're going through the la nina we know that conditions will be favorable also with the weak polar jet polar vortex jet stream that's going to give us more shots of cold air from the arctic look at this plummeting now i know why all the mainstream weather channels are telling us we're officially in a la nina yes we are folks 0.734. Now, this will continue to drop. How much further will it go? 1.2, I believe, is as, as low as it got last year on La Nina. So we'll keep our eyes on that to see if we get a stronger La Nina or just an, the same strength as we had last year's La Nina. And just looking at the ice one more, term, one more time to see the advances. Nothing changed just yet. I will update that when we get the chance as far as when the data comes in. Now, before we go tonight... I want everyone to uh, be reminded that we are doing our live call-in show for the first time in almost a year. If you want to call us tomorrow night, we'll be live on YouTube broadcasting this possibly hour-long call-in show. It just depends on how many callers we have. Topic is open. You guys can ask us questions or you can tell us about what you're doing to prep for the Grand Solar Minimum. If you want to be a part of the show, become a Patreon member, folks. That's right. For just a buck, you guys will have access to the phone number on a weekly basis. You can call in, especially when we get special guests to come onto the show with us. That gives you a chance to talk to some of the people that you guys follow and some of the new up-and-coming scientists that are also finding out that this planet indeed is cooling. So be sure to join us, folks, tomorrow night, 9 p.m. here on YouTube with our live call-in show. Again, if you want to be a caller on the live call-in show, all you have to do is go over to our Patreon channel, become a member, and actually Mari will be setting up the phone number ASAP. Uh, expect delivery on the phone number, Patreon uh, members, here within the next 8 to 12 hours. We should have that information. Again, that's tomorrow night at 9 p.m. sharp. Tune in live on YouTube. And Patreon members, you have the phone number to call in, ask questions, or just give us a call and let us know what the Grand Solar Minimum means to you and how you're preparing yourself and your family. I want to say hello to a few people out here. Revolution, Revolutionary Liberation, hello there. Good to see you. Laura, hello. Heather, new to the chat. Haven't seen you before. Glad to have you. Also, Shirley Davis, glad to have you as always. Our New York friend, Jerome, Elise, hello. Knife Collector, good to have you out here tonight. And of course, my lovely wife, Mari. Hello, my love. How are you? Uh, Pete, how's it going, bud? Lots of new faces in the chat. Always enjoy seeing that. Want to say hello to a few people out there. Matt Bros, hope you're doing better out there. And David Birch, our friend David Birch, he has had his surgery. He is in physical therapy now. He should be home out of the hospital in another week. So if you guys go to our Twitter page, we have his flyer and his PayPal account. He's still going to need some help, folks. If you have anything extra to give, anything would help. I don't care if it's a buck, two bucks. Anything helps in this situation. He's been in the hospital now for almost two months. So again, thank you all for the support and the prayers that you have poured in for him. And thankfully, finally, we are starting to see a recovery date just around the corner. Also, saying hello to Arnold Schmidt and Patricia Clayton. Glad to have you as well and always, guys. Thank you once again for tuning in to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. And listen, if you want to be a part of the live call-in show, become a Patreon member. Again, the phone number will be sent out to our Patreon members between the next 8 and 12 hours. Until then, folks, have a great night, and we will talk soon. Take care. Do you like this show? Give us a thumbs up. Want to support us more? Share to your favorite social media platform. Buy a t-shirt or become a Patreon. All links are in the description below.